might drop it. Three army personnel attached just right now. You do? Yeah. I'll be darn. You get me on camera? minutes and why the greeting. Well, George has been all over the world and just got back from Saudi Arabia, so <laughs> we're really saying hello here. And hello to all of you. Here we are again. Uh, try to make this very brief, and I'm, there isn't much time that never is much time. But uh, we're revving up for a campaign again. I know you're all aware of this, and uh, maybe some few reminders are in order. I know that the Republican National Committee headquarters over there can give you all the facts and figures and everything you need for all the arguments that you'll be having in the locker room and cocktail parties and so forth from here on. But I can't resist maybe throwing a few at you right now. I think the issues in this campaign are going to be on our side. I know there's a recession. I know also that there are people that are charging that we're responsible for the recession. The only thing is the recession came along before our program did. <laughs> so I, I don't think we could do it retroactively. And uh, you know, we've, we've been blamed for that. As a matter of fact, uh, the other day I read an article, a group of astronomers has said that in the next 10,000 years, one of the largest stars in the Milky Way is going to explode. And he said the astronomers couldn't pin it down as to just when in that 10,000 years it's going to take place. But one thing is certain, it will be blamed on our even <laughs> economic <laughs> You know, I said some reminders. Jerry Ford and I were down in Texas the other night, a fundraiser down there for Bill Clements. And uh, Jerry was reminding us about the 76 you remember his opponent at that time <laughs> invented what he called the misery index. You obtained it by adding the rate of unemployment with the rate of inflation. And in Jerry's time, with inflation at 4.8 percent and unemployment of something of seven and a fraction percent, it came out to around 12 plus, 12, 4 or 5, uh, 0.4 or 5 percent. And Jimmy Carter said that no man had the right to seek re-election, who had a misery index of that size. <laughs> Shouldn't be allowed to run. Well, in 1980, the misery index was around 20. Inflation was 12.4, yes. Unemployment had even increased by then. And of course, the interest rates had gone up to 21.5%. <laughs> now, one of our congressmen, a representative, in the House one day a few weeks ago in some discussion of our economic program, said something that, uh, well, it was a kind of a nostalgic what if, and I thought it was wonderful. Dan Lundgren said, what if on the eve of the inauguration of this administration in 1981, a journalist had given his editor a story and said that the new administration would, in a year and a half, take inflation, which had been double digit for more than 24 months, down to zero, down to actual deflation, no inflation at all. The interest rates would go from the six point plus that they were in uh, at the end of Jerry Ford's administration to 21 and a half would come down by four and a half or five points in the first year of the new administration. And productivity, which had been negative for three years, would finally show the first time in four years real growth. 
And then he said the editor would turn him down and tell him that they had too much of a reputation for truth in their publication to print such a wild and <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, inflation has come down because as Dan Lundgren added, it happened, everything that we said. For the last six months, inflation has been running at 2.8%. And for the last three months, it's been running at less than 1%. And there was one of those three months in which it actually was below zero. We had deflation. And there is national defense we talked about the last time. When we took office, this administration, we found that on any given day, half our planes couldn't take off for lack of spare parts. Many of our ships couldn't leave harbor when they were scheduled to, for the same reason, or for lack of crew. The morale of the armed forces was so low that the enlistment rates, we couldn't keep up uh, even the minimum requirements. And our non-commissioned officers were not re-enlisting, they were leaving the service in droves to take private jobs. Well now, the enlistments are up as full as they can be, but also there's a great increase in the quality of the people and the educational level, the intelligence level of the people that are enlisting. And the non-coms are staying in, in droves. And the morale, well, we ran into that at Temple Off Airdrome last week in, in Europe. There they were, a whole bunch of our GIs and some of their families and their children out there to see us when we landed. There's no problem with their morale. And I had a letter from one of our ambassadors over there who'd been up on the eastern German border and visiting one of our armored cavalry regiments. And he said as he left, a 19-year-old lad followed him over the helicopter and asked him if he could get a message to me. And being an ambassador, he thought he could. <laughs> and the kid said, well, would you just tell him for us, we're proud to be here and we ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> well, now I know that our opponents say that we're spending too much on national defense. Well, defense is less than 30% of our budget. But back in Camelot, John F. Kennedy was president, uh, defense was 46% of his budget. And the budget cuts that we're asking, that the needy are going to be doing without, and that we're not going to be able to provide medical care for all of the people that need it. Well, in Camelot, 20 years ago, the total budget, percentage of the budget that was devoted to human needs was 29%. In ours, it's 51%. But the truth is, there haven't been any budget cuts. The budget this year is bigger than it was last year, and the budget next year is going to be bigger than the one this year. What we're calling budget cuts is a reduction in the increase in spending, which in the four years before we got here had averaged 17% a year. Well, this year we cut that in half, and next year it'll be sizably reduced again, and we think it's getting down to where one of these days soon, We'll be spending within our means. We'll be balancing the budget. <laughs> and as you know, we've kept our promise to cut taxes. And they'll be continued. We had the first installment. The second installment will come in a few days on July 1st, and the third one will come on July 1st next year. When the 82 campaign really gets underway, let our opponents, if you think they have any concern about the issues, let them explain why they fought as hard as they did to keep the increase in spending up and to not let us reduce that increase in spending. And let them explain to the American people why they opposed and fought all the way that tax cut program and then even after it's passed, they're still trying to repeal some of the installments that have not yet taken place. And let me explain why now, or let them explain, I should say, because I can't, why now they're so distressed about the deficits when for the last few decades their deficit spending over which they presided had led to the trillion dollar debt that we now have. And they told us, if you'll remember in the new economics, that we shouldn't worry about the deficit spending because we owed the debt to ourselves. Well, I don't know. We're out for a balanced budget 
and we're out for a constitutional amendment that will then make that a part of the Constitution that government has to adhere to a balanced budget from now on. When we were in Europe a few days ago on that trip, I think some other things were evident also. You read about all the demonstrations, but what you didn't read about so much was the fact that every street we went down in those six cities in four countries were lined with people, most of them waving American flags and holding up homemade signs that read, we love you, America. And we were able to tell them on every occasion and tell you that our defense buildup is not so that we can go to war. It's so that no adversary will dare start a war and that we will remain at peace. The, and so the Soviets, when they meet us in just 11 days on the 29th, they're going to meet us in the beginning of the negotiations to reduce the nuclear weapons that we both have aimed at each other in the world. It's so that this time they'll sit across the table from us and know that they had better legitimately for their first time join us in arms reduction or they're going to face the industrial might of the United States that's going to see that we keep on building whatever is necessary to ensure that there won't be a war. What we're planning is all summed up in a cartoon. I don't know whether you saw it. It was Brezhnev. Brezhnev was talking to a, to a Russian general, and he said, I like the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. <laughs> going to have that anymore. And just in case you're worried, there's just a, oh, incidentally, two little news items. One happens to be a figure again. Uh, two days ago, we have a task force made up of inspectors general now. And every six months they report. And their only instructions were to go out there into every agency and department of government and be meaner than junkyard dogs. <laughs> and they gave their third report just two days ago. And in the six months that ended, March 31st, in that six-month period, they have saved the American people $5.8 billion. <laughs> and the other thing is as late as today. There's been a problem. You know what our concern is with Poland, Afghanistan, and some of the other things that happened. And last December, we announced the installation of some sanctions with regard to the Soviet Union that this country would not sell them the needed equipment uh, for them to go forward with their gas pipeline, natural gas pipeline from Siberia to Western Europe. And after the summit meetings, and we've discussed about shutting off credit, uh, we don't see why we should subsidize with low interest loans uh, the further military buildup of the Soviet Union. Today, we <laughs> we had our meeting today, and the decision has been announced. We are not going to lift those sanctions. Indeed, we're going to expand them right. to American right. companies that have <laughs> subsidiary That's all I've got. I've been talking longer than I intended to and talking too long, except just to remind you, we need to keep that Senate majority that we have. We wouldn't have achieved half of what we've been able to do if both houses were against us. So they've got to be returned to office and add a few to help them out. And then I know that tradition says that in this off-year election, the party that doesn't have the White House always adds to the members of, that they have in the House of Representatives. Let's change that around too. I don't know whether we could go all the way in one jump and get a majority in that other house. But I can tell you, this would be the happiest house in the world. <laughs> and then governors and state legislators. Remember the 11th commandment, all of us preach it every place we go and get them because we're gonna get that federalism program in place in which we're going to do what we promised for years and turn back to the states and local communities a lot of the things the federal government has been mismanaging 
We're going to turn it back there, and then we're going to get good, solid Republicans there in the state houses and even in the local offices where partisan elections are permitted in order to manage those programs the way they should be managed. So God bless you all for being here, and I'm going to shut up. Thank <laughs> you.